Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Professor Leon Blevins of El Paso Community College Television. I have with me today a guest that goes back to my teaching career here in 1974. I started teaching here in 72. And uh, most of my students were just coming back from the war in Vietnam or some that uh, were in the military were being phased out because they weren't going to be sent to Vietnam. And I had in one of the classes a student named Richard Gilliland. I saw him at a Border Patrol event uh, two or three years ago, and he handed me his card, and it said on there, Texas Rifle Association, West Texas Division or something. And so I said, I'm gonna put you in my files, and I want you to be on my television show sometime. So here I am finally getting around to it, and Richard, welcome to the program. Well, Dr. Blevins, good to meet you. <laughs> good to see, see you, you again, again. Yeah. good to see you. Now, I told Richard, I'm gonna start with this. Within the last couple of days, in carrying on a conversation with four different women, and they asked me, what's your subject for your next interview? And I said, guns. And three out of those four said, oh, that's a hot topic. I said, yes, it is a rather hot topic right now. Here we are in the early part of March of 2018. But I said, my interview is I want to discuss this with my former students, something about the good uses of guns and then the bad uses of guns. So I pulled up a book. When I was in college back in the 19, late 50s and early 60s, I became an after-dinner speaker at a lot of different places, churches, uh, service clubs, and so on. And this became my favorite topic, based upon some lectures of a Cornell University professor back in the 30s and 40s. In 1944, he did a series of lectures at the University of Michigan about freedom and responsibility in the American way of life. And that's where I want to take this conversation with Richard today, is talk about the responsible use in life and the irresponsible. One quick quote from Dr. Carl Becker's book. Democratic government is self-government, and self-government, if it is to be more than an empty form, is something far more than the popular election of representatives to make laws regulating everything, and thereby to relieve the people of the responsibility for what they do. Whatever the form of government may be, it is not self-government unless the people are mostly intellectual enough and honest enough to do on their own accord what is right and necessary with a minimum of legal compulsion and restraint. In other words, we need to be responsible for our own actions because government cannot do everything for us and government cannot regulate everything that we're doing. What do you think about that, Richard? Well, I think it's so very true. Uh, it, with respect, you know, to, uh, to gun ownership and the like, you know, um, some of us are, are raised, you know, around guns. And from the very beginning, we, we're taught respect for that firearm. We're mm -hmm. taught respect for it. We know it from, from the muzzle to the end of the butt stock. We know the bolt action of it. We know how it functions. Above all, we're taught safety. We're taught that to, you know, always point the, the rifle or the handgun in a safe direction. Uh, we're taught to do not assume that a gun is not loaded. Always be sure that the gun is not loaded. Mm -hmm. And, you know, simply by, you know, just opening the bolt, looking in, in, into the chamber. All right and assuring that the gun is not loaded. And well, just I grew up in that kind of environment. My father was a hunter. He used <clears throat> rifles of all kinds and even bow and arrow sometimes to hunt deer. And I inherited some of his guns when, when he went on. But um, when I was young, I was taught to use BB guns, pellet guns, 22 rifles, 410 shotguns, and then larger guns. And all of those rules were very important, mm -hmm. responsible gun use. And my sister, when she got married, she married a man and they became very active deer hunters and pheasant hunters and quail hunters. And so they provided meat. And we had, they wouldn't share their pheasant and their quail with us much, <laughs> but <laughs> venison, you know, and so that was it. The good use yes. of the gun. Th th those, those are good uses. And you know, so many, so many people do rely on the gun, you know, for sustenance, you know, to go out hunting, to, you know, to take the deer, to take the quail, to take the pheasant because that's part of, of the meal that they provide to their families. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, uh, again, with everything is done in, in the means of safety and providing for the family. 
But I'm, I'm 80 years old, and I remember when I was very young, living in a rural area, small town, outdoors area, could go hunting rabbits and prairie dogs and um, rattlesnakes, and you needed <laughs> mm -hmm. the gun yeah. to get exactly. a rattlesnake. Yeah. And if you had a 410 shotgun, you were better off than yeah. a 22 mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you had a scatter to get rid of that. Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of exciting to me as a young kid growing up, and I, I sold my guns when I went off to college mm -hmm. because I wanted the money for books. And I needed those more than I needed the guns. Yeah. Uh, did you ever hunt deer? Uh, I hunted deer when I was uh, probably about 12, 13 years old, lived in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And I hunted deer on occasion. This was a time that when you, you actually you would try to track your deer. I was too young to understand it. You know, set out in the woods somewhere and wait for deer to come along. I actually <laughs> tried to track them. <laughs> you had to follow the deer. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, that didn't work very, very well. So as a result, I never brought a deer home. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you weren't a real great deer hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Not a great deer hunter, but I did okay with some squirrels and rabbits. Though. Okay, now let's talk about the skill. Uh, we just finished the Olympics in uh, South Korea. Right. Okay, and I know that they were showing some scenes of biathlon, where it was long distance skiing and stopping every so often and using the rifle for skill purposes right. to shoot mm -hmm. the targets. Right. Tell me about this. You brought some targets for display. Well, th these are targets that, uh, that we shoot at 1,000 yards. And we use very different calibers of rifles, whether they be 6.5 Creedmoor, uh, 6. Uh, X6 XC, 6 Dasher, and so on like this. These are all uh, rifles that are used in the uh, F-class competitions that are held around the United States. And uh, these are targets from our most recent match this past second Saturday of the month. And what we have here is a comparison of, of a heavier bullet versus a lighter bullet on a windy day. And, and we can see that that with the heavier bullet, the gentleman was able to stay yeah. on target in a, in a very, right. very decent area. Whereas with the lighter right. bullet, you start to see that the bullet, bullets the wind is carrying we them. We know which way the wind was coming right, from. Exactly, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, so the, 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 the situation here is to be able to use what we call holdover. Mm -hmm. And if you don't hold the right holdover, then what happens is in this case, this gentleman stayed on target and the other shooter did not. He was not able to stay on okay, target. Okay, now you didn't get deer, but did you ever get any medals for skill shooting? I never did. I, I take, no, I'll take it back. I got one when I was in the military. I got an expert medal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My expert badge, that was it, yeah. <laughs> okay. But you do enjoy this as a sport? Oh, very much so, very much so. I shoot uh, two or three times a week. Um, I have I go I participate in a thousand yard match on the second Saturday uh, of each month that we have out at the Fort Bliss Rod and Gun Club. Okay, so it's at Fort Bliss. Uh, do you want to give a telephone number for anybody that's interested in joining your organization? You know, I don't I don't have their phone number with me. I've got it in my phone, but I just don't have it with me. Okay, right we now. will leave that with Marco Lara, our co-producer, okay. mm -hmm. and he can weave that up there so right. they'll have a number if they yeah. want to get in touch. Right and maybe join your organization. Yeah, yeah the Fort Bliss Rod and Gun Club is open to the public. A lot of people think that because it's on a military reservation that it's not open to the public, mm -hmm. but it is. It is open to the public. Only, only thing that needs to be done is go into the clubhouse, uh, present a valid ID. They will give you, uh, you pay your range fee, and you go out to whichever range you're going to shoot at and, 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 and go for it. Do you pay a membership fee for the year or something or just range I, fee I when do. you're well, using it? My membership fee comes to me free of charge because I'm, I'm a uh, totally disabled veteran. I'm 100% disabled. Okay. So, so my membership fee is, is uh, 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 I would just say, no cost to me. Okay. Uh, uh, there are various ranges in, as far as uh, membership fees are concerned based on what your status is, your veteran status or just being a straight civilian. Okay. What are some other advantages you would see with the gun as a useful device? A Most lawful, legal, non-murderous device. The the first thing that comes to my mind is self-defense. That's the first thing that comes to my mind okay. is self-defense. Uh, home defense, protection of my family, uh, you know, uh, even to the protection of uh, maybe coming to the aid of someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the hunting and of course the shooting sports. You know, you, you've got various shooting sports like uh, 
you're trapping skeet sports uh, that use a shotgun. You have long range shooting such, such as we have here. Well, the U.S. Supreme Court in the so-called Heller case upheld the right of individuals or families to have guns in their home yes. for self-protection. Mm -hmm. uh, Justice Scalia, who wrote that opinion, did not say that all guns were acceptable in your home. The government still has a right to regulate guns in certain right. ways. Right. Yeah. The, uh, uh, the laws, as they are right now, prohibit a person from owning a fully automatic weapon okay. or a fully automatic rifle. Uh, and this, this, this goes back to, the, back to the days of the prohibition and when, they, when the gangsters were using Thompson machine guns, they were using the Browning automatic rifles that were later used in World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they put a ban on these just due to the uh, effect that the gangsters were using them for them. Many years ago, uh, when my uh, daughter, we have two sons and a daughter, and our daughter was 14, ended up in school with an 18-year-old who had his eye on her, and she kept turning him away and so on, and he became a threat to our family. And so uh, I have the two sons there at the house and my wife there at the house, and this young man would come up and throw things at the window of my daughter and drive a car or a big truck up on the yard and spin out and throw our grass all over the place mm -hmm. and bad things. And, uh, eventually, I had him arrested, <clears throat> but one of my sons, he wanted to go out and have a fist fight with him when we'd catch him early in the morning, three in the morning or something out in the yard. And I said, no, don't do that, but I do have a shotgun, and I kept the shotgun handy, and I knew how to use it, and I said, if he tries to do us harm, I know how to protect us with my shotgun. Mm -hmm. I kept hoping I would never use it. I eventually had him arrested. He was taken off by the police. We went down, and they booked him. Then he jumped bail and we never saw him again. He left the state. That was the good news. But I had a student years ago that uh, she had a boyfriend at community college, broke up with him and he eventually went to her house, shot and killed her and her mother. And their names are on the monument at Yucca Park, I believe it is, um, uh, on what Yarborough Drive near Carolina. Mm -hmm. And so there's the bad use of the gun when people are using it in anger or retaliation or something. Now let's talk about that, the bad use of the gun and what's going on now. And if you have any of your suggestions about what to do about the bad use of the gun. Well, the, I, the, the bad use of the guns uh, definitely needs to be have a closer look. It needs to be looked at a lot closer than what it has been in the years past. Uh, we're starting to see that you know, the violence in the schools occur more often. Uh, we can look at Chicago, what's not often reported but in the news media is all the violence and the murders and the shootings that are taking place in Chicago. Uh, you know, the law enforcement up there, their hands are tied, there's very little that, that they can do. Uh, you know, with uh, Columbine, with Sandy, uh, Sandy Hook, I believe it is, and then now more recently in Florida. Uh, there definitely is a need to take a closer look at things. I know people are talking about the, the mental health issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I do believe, if, if I'm correct, that most of these shootings are occurring by people that do have mental health issues. For some reason, you know, they, they've been in, in some kind of uh, psychiatric care or psychological care, and then they quit that, uh, quit that treatment and then they just go off on the, on, the, uh, on the wrong side. Well, some of them, but not everyone that is mentally ill is going to kill people. We know that. But uh, the easy accessibility of guns mm -hmm. and the <clears throat> magnitude of the damage they can do, such as military guns being purchased by civilians, mm -hmm. the, uh, what, what do you think about that? Should there be restrictions on the use of military guns in the civilian community? Um, I don't think so. I, I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the proper hands, you know, I any gun is safe. Any gun is safe. It's a mechanical device. Mm -hmm. The only reason that, that it functions and operates is because it's in someone's hands, someone has loaded it, and someone has pulled the trigger. That's the only reason that it operates is by the individual effort. Uh, I, I think that the uh, possibly restrictions on these guns uh, may have an effect, but I think in the long run what's going to take place and, and 
maybe in a year or so we may see more restrictions, such as age limits. I think 18, 19 years old is an age limit to buy a, to purchase a rifle from a from a licensed firearm dealer. Mm -hmm. uh, 21 years of age is, is the age for to purchase a uh, uh, the handgun. And I think that probably we won't see any changes as far as the gun laws are concerned until probably about a year or so from now. I don't, but I think immediately, no, we're not going to see any changes. So we're seeing some suggested changes of raising the age. Right. So if you can buy a handgun, you have to be 21, but the long rifle, 18. Right. They'll probably start matching that and raise it up. Yeah. I understand that what they're talking about is to raise the age from 18 up to 21 before the purchase of any gun, and in some cases, ammunition. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a couple of sporting goods stores, uh, uh, I think Walmart for one and Dick's Sporting Goods for another one, has, has said that they will uh, have said, it was reported, put it this way, it was reported here a few days ago, that they would stop selling, you know, the automatic, not the automatic, but the AR-style, military-style right. type of rifles. Mm -hmm. um, I heard on the news this morning <coughs> that they will raise the age limit instead to age 21 before they would sell a rifle uh, uh, to an individual. So this is still in flux. We don't this know exactly very which much way it's going flux. to go. Yes, okay. it is, yeah. And just yesterday, Donald Trump met with a number of legislators with mm -hmm. regard to this issue, and he's been all over the map with different suggestions of what he thinks should and should not be done yeah. in that mm -hmm. regard. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to the use of deadly force and mass deadly force, such as at Las Vegas, Nevada. For a while it was Pulse uh, in Florida, Orlando, Florida, the largest mass shooting in American history, modern history. And then we go to a larger one uh, in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. where 50 something were killed and hundreds were wounded. How does your organization deal with that and your membership deal with that of talking about, because these are talked about. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that about how, how to help these people and compensate these people with regard to what's happened to them because they're psychologically damaged and some physically damaged for the rest of their lives. Well, the, the, the NRA, uh, as an example, you know, is uh, looking into uh, and discussing with the President of the United States, you know, what, what limitations can they put on this. Now, the NRA is not going to restrict any kind of uh, of how would you say uh, f firearm possession if, in, in particular case if, if you're legally able to own and possess a firearm they're not going to put any restrictions on that anything that has to do with, with shooting they're not going to put restrictions on mm -hmm. now they my understanding is uh, based on the news is that they are uh, you know considering some things that are in line with what the president of the United States is wanting mm -hmm. And you know to uh, you know uh, to protect the uh, protect the, the schools, they're talking about uh, instead of making uh, the schools a soft target, make them hard targets. The NRA has said that the only way to take care of a, of a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, and that seems to be more and more and more as we go along. Seems to be the seems to be an answer, not maybe the correct answer, not completely the full answer. But, but an answer to But there's no equivalency sometimes, such as in the, the case in uh, Parkland, Florida, I guess it is. There was a security guard there with a gun, a pistol. Mm -hmm. But the shooter comes in with a military-style weapon. And of course, that guard did not go in. Now he's retired. They said, you're out of here. You don't work here anymore. And some others were refusing to go in because it was not an equivalency. So would you want all security guards to be given a military-style weapon at the front of the school instead of a revolver if people are going to come in with a military weapon? Well, <laughs> to be honest with you, I haven't thought that far into it. It, it may well be that that may be the thing to do. Now, uh, I, I myself would see no wrong if, if this individual is outside the school. We're talking about a police state inside the school, a prison state inside the schools. Mm -hmm because if someone's walking around with guns or something like that, you might as well have the students be in a prison. Um, I think that probably what will, what will occur if, the, if, if this kind of thing were to take place, where you've got armed guards outside the school, that eventually what would happen is that the students would 
you know, come to realize that this individual is there, you know, for me. And it would become just like an everyday thing. I'm passing this guy, the security guard, he's got a weapon, you know, and it would not be a bother to him. Yeah. Uh, some of the people, <laughs> the parents might be a little upset with their taxes going up to pay for extra security guards and extra large military weapons. But that's another debate in itself. Yeah. Okay, well, let's close out. Let's get off of the, the bad use of the gun. And let's come back to your organization and what you do. Do you raise money for benevolent purposes, for scholarships, uh, gun training classes, or things like that? What we have, the NRA has a very, various number of programs that they offer to, to, to women in the shooting sports, to, to youth in the shooting sports. They offer all kinds of classes on gun handling, whether it be shotgun, rifle, pistol. Uh, they offer classes uh, and training on, uh, on how to reload ammo. Uh, now these are usually uh, not from the, the NRA directly what these are. These are people that have been trained, highly trained, to go out and teach uh, you know the, these various programs and gun safety and hand reloading and, 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 li and the like. Now you do some of these, right? I do hand loading. I uh, I used to be a. a, a you brought a, something today, well, didn't you? I have uh, what I have here <coughs> is a reloading die set, and these are dies that that uh, we use that I use in my rifles to where I can uh, size my brass, I can, uh, uh, you know, seat my bullets and neck size my brass and things like that because after a period of time, the brass starts to change. And so you need these dies in order to put the, put the brass back into form so that you can easily chamber and uh, uh, chamber the round and also be able to load it. Well, that's very technical. Is this what you get into talking about calibers of, of the gun? Very different calibers, very different <laughs> calibers. For, for every caliber of gun that you would have to reload with, you would have a separate set of dies. So if you got if you have four rifles of four different calibers, then you would have if you're going to do hand loading, then, then what you would have would be uh, uh, four different sets of dies to do your hand loading. Did you ever do any of your own powder making? No, I never have. I never have. But you know some people that have even gone. I know that far, some right? people that do, but not many. Not okay. many. Yeah, and we know the history. And, and most generally, that would be black powder. Yeah. Right. And uh, the black powder comes comes from the Chinese back in the sixth and seventh centuries when they invented uh, they come across somehow or another to <laughs> to make black powder, which they later used in their fireworks. Uh, later on, uh, I think some one of them decided, well, let's stick something in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a piece of cane. Let's see what happens. A projectile. <laughs> For a projectile. There you go. Yeah. And so, therefore, started you know the the movement towards uh, to the firearms where we have them today. Well, for several, for several years, I worked very actively with the Concordia Cemetery Association right. and participated in walk through history. And so, I purchased a number of replica guns. Uh, the most interesting one was a Colt uh, rifle. A six shooter, mm -hmm. very unusual, and I've seen some museums of the gun. You've been to some museums on guns, haven't right. you? Mm -hmm. And they uh, had signs indicating there were only a few thousand of those ever manufactured. Right. Uh, they lost popularity when Winchester came along with the repeating action with the lever handle. The lever and so action, on. right? A man named Henry, he comes along with a rifle, then Winchester comes along with one, and so I would show these to people at the walk through history and especially the young kids were fascinated with these. Kids are always fascinated with mm -hmm. guns. That's one of the dangers with kids because kids don't realize the, the lethality of what they're handling when exactly. they pick up of something. And so what about that on gun safety? That, that, that particular part of gun safety falls in the hands of the parents. They should at all, at all times make sure that any gun that they have in the house, whether it be a, a pistol, uh, or a long gun, you know, a long rifle, a uh, shotgun, that it should be properly secured to the point to where no child, no minor can get a hold of it. Uh, even, a, even a person that uh, could be 18 years of age, which is, you know, a legal adult, if they don't know anything about guns, they should not even be touching with that gun. Mm -hmm. What should be taking place is if they're going to try to handle that gun is that they should get a responsible adult have them go out to the range with them or here in, in El Paso area out in the desert and start getting some very, very basic uh, safety handling rules 
of the gun so they can better un understand the gun, how they can better handle it. I think most states have laws that hold parents or others responsible for improperly handling the gun and it leading to the death of some child. Yeah, uh, that matter of fact, that's, uh, there's a felony in the state of Texas that if a minor, I believe it's uh, 16 years of age or, or under, gets uh, gets into, let's say, the individual's gun safe or they go into the cabinet and pull out the pistol mm -hmm. and they take it to their friend, start showing their friend and accidentally kill the friend, then, you know, then that parent is going to be held liable for that and it is a felony offense in the state of Texas. Oh my goodness. Well, you know, I think we've, uh, we've covered a lot of areas with regard to guns today and two different sides, the good use and the bad use of the gun. And the public can get some, has been given some useful information from what you've been sharing with Thank us, you. and we're glad that you came today. Um, uh, when it comes to this subject, we need to let the audience know that any statements, mine or my guest, with regard to this subject, it's not the policy of the college, or the policy of the program, it's our personal opinions or information or knowledge that we have that we can share with public. And that's what this program is about, Richard. It's about information and education. And you're in that field with regard to a very important subject, the subject of guns. Any last word before we close out? Be very safe. Uh, always treat a gun uh, as, as if it's loaded. Make sure that it's always unloaded. Don't don't t don't take it for granted that the gun is is, is not loaded. Mm -hmm. Always check, make sure that the gun is unloaded. Always point it in a safe direction. And good shooting. Well, I hope you get all the targets right there in the middle. What we call <laughs> I do too. the bullseye. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for coming, Richard. Good to Dr. see you. Again. Good seeing you again. After all these years. After all these years. And you do remember a few of the things I taught you, don't you? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that the professor is always right. Professor is always right. Well, tune in for another show in the future, and we will once again give you some information that you may find very useful, even life saving. Thanks. I'm Leon Blevins. <laughs>